In the Cold War, information is power. In a bid to outdo each other, the Soviet Union and the United States of America conceive of new ways to obtain information that will see them gain an edge in technological supremacy. So there's a certain kind of existential threat that the Cold War forced upon the military and compelled it to act in ways that produced, almost by accident, the underlying communication infrastructure that we see today. Data collection manifests through espionage, deception, and invention. There were Russian specialists gathering information on new American ways of warfare to produce countermeasures. High-altitude spy planes and space satellites observe military maneuvers and state secrets. Global communication networks and espionage technology will go on to inspire the future technology of the digital age. The Cold War, a decades-long struggle between two superpowers and former allies, the United States of America and the Soviet Union. But beyond the ideological divide of capitalism and communism was a battle of another kind, one for technological supremacy. And for each of these systems, science and technology were critical for how they were going to thrive and grow and bring prosperity and justice for their people. Experimentation with nuclear power, innovation of weapons technology, exploitation of science capabilities. The entire space program, you could argue, was a creature of the Cold War. A race for scientific supremacy that lifts humanity beyond Earth's atmosphere, drags the world to the brink of nuclear annihilation, and launches decades of research into scientific and engineering marvels that continue to define the modern world. Gathering intelligence on an enemy has been a feature of war throughout the ages. But in the Cold War, information gathering offers military and ideological advantage. It means being able to develop nuclear weapons, intercontinental missiles, and supersonic jets. Being able to gather information or not could mean the difference between victory or defeat. In an age before high-tech surveillance, it is people who are relied on for intelligence gathering. Most people, I've found, are fascinated by spies and spying, but for the most part, it's fairly dreary, painstaking and frustrating work. But the point is, of course, with human intelligence, every so often, very rarely, but every so often, you get a tremendous payoff. In the race to develop atomic weapons, Soviet spies embed themselves in nuclear weapons research and development programs in Canada, the United Kingdom and the United States. So in the late 1940s, the United States had an atomic monopoly, meaning it was the only country on Earth that had its own atomic weapon. And for military leaders, this was a secret that had to be guarded. They did this through classified information. They did it through security background checks. They did it through loyalty oaths. The smallest bits of political activism could get you flagged and not allowed to get a security clearance. Despite these measures, the Soviet Union is successful at infiltrating the United States project to build the world's first atomic bomb. History Hit is an award-winning streaming platform built by history fans for history fans. Our goal is to bring you award-winning documentaries that cover the events and figures that have shaped our world all in one place. Travel with us to the fascinating world of prehistoric Scotland or uncover the lives of the people who called Pompeii home. We also aim to bring you the stories and legends that shaped our world through our award-winning podcast network. Sign up now for a free trial and Timeline fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code TIMELINE at checkout. August 1944. Klaus Fuchs begins work in a theoretical physics division at the Los Alamos Laboratory. If you look at Klaus Fuchs, he was an idealistic young man. He'd seen what Nazism could do. He joined the Communist Party just before he left Germany, went to Britain, got a very good education in physics. When he was posted to start to build the atom bomb, he could see the uh, tremendous effect this would have on the balance of power in the world. And he wanted the Russians to also know about this. One month later, Fuchs is present at the Trinity test site and witnesses firsthand the destructive power of the atomic bomb. 
I always thought the great irony is that once the, uh, the bomb is tested at Trinity, the so-called gadget, President Truman, the new president, who didn't know a damn thing about the bomb until he became president, he walks up to Stalin at the Potsdam Conference and says, we have a new weapon we're going to use against the Japanese. And Stalin looks at Truman and he says, well, I hope you use it well. What Truman didn't realize is that Stalin had complete knowledge of what was going on at Los Alamos and the Manhattan Project. He probably knew more about the atomic bomb than, than Harry Truman did. Stolen and smuggled blueprints and other top secret plans accelerate the development of the Soviet nuclear weapons program. To build an atom bomb is a very complex theoretical and practical undertaking. And the sort of information that the atomic spies got back to the Russians was general plans on how to build the bomb, but most importantly, it was how to avoid going down rabbit burrows that didn't lead anywhere. In August of 1949, the Soviet Union detonated its first atomic weapon. And when that happened, the Americans assumed that it must be because of espionage. And the intelligence operatives weren't wrong. There was significant espionage in the US atomic program. January 1950. Klaus Fuchs confesses to being a Soviet spy. This leads to the uncovering of more conspirators, such as husband and wife Americans, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. As Julius Rosenberg and Morton Sobel, convicted of revealing atomic secrets to the Russians, enter the federal building in New York to hear their doom. Another of the spy ring, Mrs. Ethel Rosenberg, who with her husband was convicted of actually transmitting the secrets to Russia through Soviet diplomatic channels. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg are the first American citizens to be executed for espionage. Done by electric chair at New York State's Sing Sing Prison in 1953. Early information collected during the Cold War relied on spies, feet on the ground. But as technology advances, the use of high-altitude reconnaissance planes becomes an important way of gathering information during the Cold War. August 1st, 1955. In an area that would become known as Area 51 in the Nevada desert, aircraft manufacturer Lockheed tests their top-secret experimental spy plane. The single-engine, high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft, the Lockheed U-2, colloquially known as Dragon Lady, is designed to gather intelligence through day and night at an altitude of 21.3 kilometers. An aircraft that can reach this height is thought to be able to avoid Soviet missiles and radar. With a light airframe weight and glider-like wings, the U-2 relies on a specially formulated jet fuel that will not evaporate at high altitudes. U-2 was fielded on the belief that it would only be effective and only be operational for a handful of years before the Soviets caught up and figured out how to shoot it down. As a matter of fact, the U-2 is still in service today, so it actually really exceeded its, its expected life. To gather intelligence, the U-2 is equipped with radar, antennas, and imaging equipment, including a large format camera capable of high-resolution photographs from high altitudes. The U-2 is a modular aircraft. Its payloads and intelligence gathering equipment can be swapped out and the interior refit for specific missions. May 1st, 1960. A U-2 launches from Peshawar, Pakistan to begin a flyover of the Soviet Union. Its pilot is Francis Gary Powers and his mission leads to one of the most dramatic moments of the Cold War. Francis Gary Powers was uh, tasked with investigating the possibility that the Soviets were fielding intercontinental ballistic missiles at a location known as Plesetsk. So in other words, uh, Powers went on his mission to try to figure out whether there was a missile gap or not. The aircraft is detected by Soviet air defenses and a Su-9 scrambles, attempting to bring down the American aircraft. The mission is abandoned when they fail to intercept the U-2. The American spy plane flies on, now passing above a Soviet surface-to-air missile battalion. The Soviets have another chance. This time, they seize upon it. A V-750 VN missile is deployed from the Soviet S-75 high-altitude air defense system. The missile zeroes in on the spy plane, detonating behind the U-2, damaging its tail and wings. Francis Gary Powers is lucky to escape, 
parachuting away before a second missile strikes. The information gathering advantage that America momentarily had plummets as the aircraft scatters in ruins on the outskirts of the Soviet township, Sverdlovsk. And now the Soviets have two important information sources, the captured pilot and the wreck of the U-2 spy plane. One they interrogate, the other they study. On display in Moscow, what's alleged to be the wreckage of the U-2 spy plane, which Russia claims to have shot down by rocket. A public trial for powers follows. It's the Hall of Columns in Moscow, scene of many a previous Russian trial. And now, Francis Gary Powers, pilot of the American U-2 spy plane shot down over Russia, faced the judges with composure. He behaved with dignity throughout his ordeal, though his life was possibly at stake. August 19th, 1960. Francis Gary Powers is convicted of espionage and sentenced to 10 years of confinement. Three in prison, the remainder in a labor camp. Had the US-built Blackbird SR-71 been operational for Francis Gary Powers' mission into Soviet airspace, things might have turned out differently. With a mind towards Soviet countermeasures, uh, Lockheed and the Air Force and the CIA developed the SR-71 as a high-flying, fast strategic reconnaissance aircraft. The next step in the competition after the, the Soviets figured out how to shoot down the, the U-2. Developed as a black project, one that is unacknowledged by government, military, personnel, or contractors, the Blackbird SR-71 holds the record as the highest and fastest flying, air-breathing manned aircraft on Earth. Living up to their motto, peace through surveillance, by providing information for the security of the United States and the free world. The SR-71 in a single flight has flown over 15,000 miles. On one mission, it is capable of mapping a section of the world equal to a path 60 miles wide from San Francisco to New York. Axial flow turbojet engines power the SR-71 to a cruising speed above Mach 3. It can do this at altitudes above 24.3 kilometers. The SR-71 avoids missiles in a very simple way, by accelerating. However, flying at such high speed and altitude increases atmospheric friction, which may heat the fuselage to melting point. For that reason, the aircraft is built from a lightweight and heat-resistant material, titanium. And in the Cold War, the largest supplier of this rare material is America's superpower rival, the Soviet Union. Now, the Americans resort to classic Cold War subterfuge. They establish offshore shell companies, which they use to purchase large amounts of titanium, which they export back to Area 51 in Nevada. Several weeks prior to the Blackbird's maiden flight, and after two years in a Soviet prison, U-2 pilot Francis Gary Powers is released as part of a prisoner exchange program between the U.S. FBI and the Soviet KGB. The shootdown of, of Powers U-2, his capture, his subsequent show trial, led to a suspension of overflights of the Soviet Union. So it would fall upon the development of reconnaissance satellites to carry on that strategic reconnaissance of the Soviet Union. A new kind of warfare is harnessed, one in which communication, observation, and photo reconnaissance satellites watch, listen, and learn. July 1st, 1957, the start of the International Geophysical Year. One of the most ambitious programs for international scientific cooperation during the Cold War was something called the International Geophysical Year, or IGY for short. It actually lasted 18 months instead of a year. It involved nearly 70 countries who cooperated to gather information about the natural world. A period where Cold War tensions briefly thaw and scientific and technological innovation proves that the Soviets and Americans possess advanced technological capabilities. When we talk about the IGY today, one of the reasons we remember it is because the IGY was what led to satellites. Both the United States and the Soviet Union said that they would attempt to launch an artificial satellite during the IGY. In May of 1957, 
those charged with the United States satellite program determined that small satellite spheres would be launched as test vehicles during 1957. The first of these test vehicles is planned to be launched in December of this year. But as the eyes of the world look skyward, it is not an American achievement they witness. October 4th, 1957. The world's first artificial satellite, Sputnik, is launched by the Soviet Union. At 58 centimeters in diameter, the aluminum sphere completes an orbit of the Earth approximately every 98 minutes. Sputnik 1, or as it was called, SP, or Sputnik 1, or PS, Prostoy Sputnik. It was really a very simple satellite. In terms of technical complexity, it is comparable to school satellites that are now built in some classrooms. At the time, it was a first. It was important as a demonstration that humans can do something more than simply reach space. The world's population looks up as Sputnik tracks through Earth's lower orbit passing above suburban homes, a faint radio signal, a Soviet heartbeat in space. All around the world, we listen. All around the world, it makes headline news. As the political theorist Hannah Arendt once observed, the launch of Sputnik meant that for the first time, humans could observe like a god down upon Earth itself, from outside of itself. We were an observer observing our own world for the first time. The space era started with the satellite because humans learned not only to launch something very high up, but also how to get something out to the near-Earth orbit and to leave it in space for quite a long time and to use it in some ways. For example, not a lot of people know, but the signals of the first satellite acted as a practical demonstration of the possibilities of the employment of satellite navigation systems. So it's GPS, GLONASS, Beidou, Galileo, everything that is now created, all this was born from the first satellite, from those beep-beep signals that were heard by radio lovers in those years from the sky. The United States' efforts to launch their own satellite were hampered by inefficiencies in the development of rocket systems. At least until Sputnik, the United States really refused to centralize or even plan its scientific priorities. But also inter-service rivalries between the different military agencies meant that in the mid-1950s, the Army and the Navy and the Air Force were all working on their own rocket systems. And one consequence of this was that the Soviet Union beat the United States into space. Following the launch of Sputnik, U.S. President Eisenhower looks for a response. And immediately, President Eisenhower looked around and said, who do we have, what have we got? Eisenhower wanted to do something more civilian than not. He looked at the Navy and their Vanguard rocket, which was somewhat civilian. It had a scientific purpose, even though it was a Navy rocket. Now there's explicit pressure on the labs who had developed payloads to put on the Vanguard satellites to accelerate the development of the Vanguard satellites. They were, they were moving as fast as they considered responsible when dealing with a cutting edge technology. December 6, 1957. Vanguard Test Vehicle 3 launches from Cape Canaveral. A moment or two of high expectation after the firing button has been pressed. It rises approximately 1.2 meters into the air before the engines lose thrust and it explodes on the launch pad. The world was watching in anticipation of the US matching the Soviets in this technological capability. Instead, Vanguard goes up in flames. The, 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 the launch vehicle collapses onto the launch pad. The satellite actually went bouncing across the tarmac. And so in addition to being a big technological disappointment, to scientists and engineers, this is this is also uh, a geopolitically significant event that's viewed as, as uh, a symbolic failure on the U.S.'s part. Although a public embarrassment, 
Rocket launches are still a fledgling technology, developing at a breakneck pace. We must learn to expect in the United States that we cannot have success every time we try something new in a complex scientific field. We have our work cut out for us. We are behind now in the satellite field. We will not stay that way. So in 1958, the U.S. launch success rate is 48%, and in 1959, it goes up to 51%. So it's, it's understood that these are cantankerous systems, uh, an unprecedented level of complexity in which you have a one-time shot at getting all of this right. With the failure of the Vanguard rocket, America looks to one of their other programs in development. This one under the guidance of Werner von Braun, who with his team at the Army Ballistic Missile Agency have been working on launch systems based on the German V-2 rocket technology. They'd taken that Nazi war rocket and actually built it and expanded it and, and made it bigger. It was capable of putting a satellite into space. It was capable of putting a satellite into space a year before. They just hadn't been given the go-ahead. So as soon as they said, can you do it in 60 days? They said, we can do it in half of that. And within a very short amount of time, Explorer 1, the Americans' first satellite, was launched into space by that German team. January 31st, 1958. The Explorer 1, designed and built at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California, is successfully launched by a modified Jupiter C rocket. We may be sure that a great sigh of relief accompanied the Explorer as it soared away into outer space exactly according to plan. The first U.S. satellite in space is equipped with instrumentation to measure the radiation environment in Earth's orbit. It discovers that two donut-shaped radiation belts trapped by magnetic fields loop around the Earth. These belts, now known as the Van Allen Radiation Belts, are named after Dr. James Van Allen, who along with his graduate students at the University of Iowa, designed the instrumentation for the satellite. This discovery provides important data for later space research and is considered a major discovery during the International Geophysical Year. March 17, 1958. Vanguard Test Vehicle 4 successfully launches the Vanguard 1 satellite. The Vanguard project may have been unsuccessful in its original goal, but with the successful launch of Vanguard 1, it can lay claim to another milestone. Today, it is the oldest satellite in Earth's orbit. Vanguard 1 is still in orbit, and I believe that the last estimate was that it'll remain in orbit about 600 more years. With Sputnik, the Soviet Union has won the race for the first satellite in Earth's orbit, but it sets an important precedent the United States plan on using to their advantage. And in some ways, Sputnik wasn't entirely a disaster for American leaders because it established the right of overflight, which the Americans wanted so that it could conduct high altitude surveillance, either through uh, U-2 airplanes or later through reconnaissance satellites. As the Cold War plays out, and technology launches humanity skyward. Communication technology changes the way information can be harvested. Satellites are soon equipped with television and photographic capabilities. They become eyes in the sky. So there was a, a nascent military intelligence program it hadn't been quite approved. In fact, it was the first thing approved after Sputnik. Eisenhower approved a program called Corona which is launching a camera with recoverable film pods. The Corona project had been approved by President Dwight Eisenhower in 1958, but moves forward rapidly following the shooting down of Francis Gary Powers' U-2 spy plane. Conducted under the cover of the Discoverer program, the United States Air Force tells the public that these satellites are gathering data on environmental conditions from space. Discoverer 13 roars aloft from a California launching pad. It's lucky 13, because after 17 orbital passes around the Earth, the missile's payload, a data capsule, is dropped to Earth and recovered. The true purpose of the project is to launch reconnaissance satellites intended to photograph areas of the Soviet Union inaccessible to spy planes. August 19, 1960. Discoverer 14 launches into polar orbit. It carries a single panoramic camera and nine kilograms of film. 
They took images of the Earth's surface and then they ejected these capsules with the film. And those capsules were recovered midair by aircraft. Capsules had parachutes on them and it was the job of the aircraft with a big cable device on the front of it to snatch those capsules as they were descending out of, out of midair. They're trying to catch a capsule parachuting down from satellite discoverer and the men in the flying box car succeed at the second attempt. During its 17 orbits of the Earth, Discoverer 14 covers more than 2.4 million square kilometers of Soviet territory and produces more images than all earlier U-2 missions combined. Over the course of its 12 years, the Corona program takes over 800,000 images from space, providing vital intelligence on sites associated with ballistic missiles and nuclear energy. Interestingly, this knowledge meant we need not overreact to conjectures about threats, but rather expand our defense resources more realistically. The advent of reconnaissance satellites certainly gave the United States uh, a greater understanding of the Soviet Union. It did away with the perception of a missile gap, for example. It gave us better understanding of Soviet research and development. Uh, it allowed us to monitor the size of the Soviet nuclear arsenal. Corona is now history. It stands as an important point in time. The first, the longest, and most successful of the nation's intelligence programs to date. Corona explored and conquered the unknowns of space reconnaissance. And it opened the way for more sophisticated follow-on systems. Images, data, surveillance, vast tomes of information are now transmitted via communication satellites. During the Cold War, information is conveyed, collected, and captured through technological innovation. Military-funded research programs and the rise of computer technology combine to change how information is gathered and distributed. Prior to and during the early years of the Cold War, computers used by the military were bulky and cumbersome. ENIAC, or Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, analyzed ballistics vulnerability and lethality at the United States Ballistics Research Laboratory. It is considered the world's first electronic digital computer. What would take a scientist a day to calculate, ENIAC achieved in less than a minute. Operational from the mid-1940s to the mid-1950s, ENIAC programs included calculating the feasibility of thermonuclear weapons, instrumental during the research and development phase of the hydrogen bomb. A mass of vacuum tubes, resistors, capacitors, and electronic components that weighed over 25 tons, ENIAC took up 167 square meters of space and consumed 150 kilowatts of power to function. It may have been quick to calculate, but this Goliath of a machine took weeks to program. Similarly, EDVAC, or Electronic Discrete Variable Automatic Computer, was operational at the United States Army Research Laboratory by the start of the Cold War. While reprogramming ENIAC was labor-intensive, often taking weeks, EDVAC's design revolutionized computer efficiency because it utilized a stored program concept. This computer did not require constant input and updating of instructions. Its data and programs are built into the computer's memory. EDVAC's stored program concept revolutionized and inspired the design architecture of computers from the Cold War era to the modern day. A single computer is a powerful tool at the start of the Cold War, but the next step is to expand the ways to collect, absorb, and distribute information over multiple locations. Computer networks were central to the development of the Cold War technological mindset. But computer networks in particular came around in the mid-50s, 60s, and 70s as a kind of attempt to secure a nation. Right? The computer itself, is, as a unit, is foundational to what the information age needs, namely computational processing power. But the capacity to connect those computers gave many of the Cold War superpower strategists 
the affordance or the opportunity to connect at a distance and to take actions at a distance. 1949, the United States, concerned that the Soviet Union has developed their own atomic bomb, looks for a system to warn of any incoming Soviet long-range bombers. If a bomber can reach the US, it could potentially be carrying an atomic weapon. Cold War technological projects were ambitious. They were expensive, they were innovative, and they were transformative, with lasting consequences for years to come. One of the most impressive was a project called SAGE for a semi-automatic ground environment. SAGE was a project developed out of a lab associated with MIT called Lincoln Laboratory. They came out of early computing. SAGE divided the United States into eight sectors, and each of those sectors was divided into 32 subsectors. And the, the uh, SAGE system was all about gathering information from various sensors, from, from radar, from other types of sensors, bringing that information together, making sense of it, so that decision makers could respond. So in the, in the event of, a, of an actual Soviet attack, you could launch interceptors, you could launch surface-to-air missiles, and you could launch U.S. bombers to make sure that they weren't destroyed on the ground by a Soviet attack. 1952. Funded by the United States government, MIT selects IBM to develop and build the computer that will be the brains of SAGE. You are listening to the heartbeat of the SAGE computer. Every instrument in this room is constantly monitoring, testing, pulse-taking, controlling. The ANFSQ-7 computer weighs 250 tons and is made up of over 55,000 vacuum tubes, 175,000 diodes, and 13,000 transistors. It is really two computers, but only one is operating the system. The other, with the same vast memory, performs as a slave. The total system takes up an entire floor of approximately 2,000 square meters. Each computer can operate 50 monitors or workstations, track up to 400 airplanes, and communicate with up to 100 radars, observation stations, and other sources of information. This set of data combines to give a complete picture of what's happening in US airspace. The SAGE system was a technological success. It was quite impressive the way SAGE integrated data from all sorts of different sensors, brought it together, made sense of it. But in the end, it was a, a strategic failure because it came into being just as the ICBM appeared. And so the problem was no longer merely a Soviet bomber attack, but it was a Soviet ICBM attack. And SAGE really couldn't do anything about that. Namely, SAGE is the space where we see a number of the really concrete, specific innovations that we recognize today as foundational to computing coming to life. We see the monitor, or at least the photographic heads-up display. We see the development of peripherals, like mouse and printer that connect, and how those inputs and outputs work. We see the really critical attempt to build and share files, so that files would be shared and stored uh, simultaneously on different spots. That's fundamental to a communication system. And it's all stuff that began thanks to this ultimately aborted and uh, short-lived, but nevertheless colossal investment of state funding in national communication network infrastructure. A monumental undertaking costing more than the Manhattan Project, the technology developed from SAGE goes on to form the basis of the first real-time airline booking system. SAGE was enormous. At one point, half of the country's programmers worked in SAGE. SAGE was in some ways both a uh, way to develop programming and a college to train American programmers. Many of the things that we associate with 1950s computing or later computing, things like uh, real-time airline reservations or visual displays, parallel processing, all of these ideas were developed directly from SAGE. As computing technology continues to advance, so too do ideas of ways to distribute information over a linked computer network. So this kind of communication grid, communication infrastructure um, through computer networks might mean that generals could communicate in the event of a nuclear attack. It might mean that they would be able to automate or launch in the event of an attack from the enemy, a, a nuclear retaliation. 
right? In many cases, the earliest attempts to found a national computer network follows from the existential military demand mandate to secure the nation in the event of an attack, to make it survivable. 1959, Paul Barron joins the RAND Corporation and works on a survivable computer network he believes will allow for continued communication in the event of a nuclear attack. Paul Barron realized in part uh, they needed a communication infrastructure that could be struck down at any moment that would still be able to function if only one third of it remained. Barron works on an idea of dividing up information into what he calls message blocks before sending them out across a network. 1965. Donald Davis at the National Physical Laboratory in the UK independently comes to the same solution as Paul Barron. He refers to his idea as packet switching. Now, packet switching protocols are fairly straightforward. Effectively, you take the message that the sender wants to send to the receiver, you break it up into a number of packets, effectively envelopes. You stamp each envelope with the address to which it's going to be sent, and you send them all off. And those envelopes or packets can go under any pathway. They can follow a random walk. They can go anywhere they want across this distributed system. All that matters is that they arrive at the right destination. And so long as they arrive at the right destination, the protocol will reorder the envelopes in the right order, open, it up, open them all up, and reassemble your message for you. And the brilliance of this packet switched protocol is that it allows for any part of the system to be disrupted. The Advanced Research Projects Agency, or ARPA, builds upon the ideas developed by Barron and Davis when they look to share information across computers in multiple locations across the United States. October 29th, 1969. ARPANET, the Advanced Research Projects Agency network, goes online. Initially, the network connects computers between four locations, research laboratories at UCLA, Stanford, UC Santa Barbara, and the University of Utah. The important thing to remember when we're thinking about why the ARPANET came to be is that it doesn't have a single purpose. Namely, it never had one mandate. Instead, part of its brilliance is that it solved the question of how to do computer networking without ever providing or precluding or assuming anything about the why. So of course there were really practical reasons scientists wanted to collaborate and share data over a distance one with another. But that's a purpose they could have accomplished by other means. And what the ARPANET really stands out for, I think, is its kind of generative openness to the many purposes that we as users continue to bring it today. ARPANET's software and network capabilities expand to include remote login, file sharing, and the ability to communicate via electronic mail. It completely erases the meaning of space. We can connect here and be very close to people who are all over the world. From the Cold War, ARPANET evolves into today's internet an infinitely tentacled global high-speed communication network. The vision is to have a superhighway with all the information passing for all the entertainment, for business, for all our academic institutions, for the social infrastructure of this nation. Even though the ARPANET goes on to found several very specific things that are important for the internet later, I think it's really just this kind of open imagination of the network that is most seminal, that is most influential in how we think about the internet today. Not all projects during the Cold War tech race had successful outcomes. In the Soviet Union, independent to advances in the United States, computer engineers were also working on the idea of computer networks. It's clear that intelligence agencies knew about, in the roughest terms, the networking attempts of the other side. But beyond those basic, like, acknowledgement of the concurrence of networks, there doesn't appear to be much in the way of concrete details, or especially influence. So I think what we have here is a fascinating example of how similar ideas kind of exist in the ethos and pop up in different places, but often at the same time. 
Soviet developments had suffered setbacks due to the divide between civilian and military research projects. The relationship between civilian and military interests in the Soviet Union is famously one of separate silos. For example, one of the earliest computing network pioneers, in fact, the man who first imagines and proposes a civilian computer network, was initially a military researcher. His name was Anatoly Ivanovich Kitov. And he thought, well, wait a second, why don't we apply this computing resources to uh, a public question? Namely, how do we manage the economy? How do we make the economy better so it hurts fewer and so it's more efficient and more optimal? And for this rather sensible and indeed kind of subtle proposal, he got himself in much trouble. Kitov's plan is intercepted by his military supervisors and is criticized for suggesting that military resources should be shared with civilians. His proposal results in the end of his military career, and the following year, his Communist Party membership is revoked. 1962. Viktor Glushkov, a mathematician, attempts to succeed where Kitov failed. The Orgas project is perhaps the most ambitious attempt to build a computer network that the world has ever known. It stands for the All-State Automated System, and its purpose was singular and simple to save the planned economy. Namely, it sought to usher in what we might call electronic socialism, or the attempt to bring the sluggish, paper-bound stacks of quotas and factory mandates and commands from the government and through factories up into the digital age, or at least to the electronic age. Namely, this computer network would have a central computing center in Moscow that would be the command and control, basically the brains of the operation. And that mother node, as it were, would connect to the second level where as many as 200 prominent computing centers would be found throughout major cities. And then those 200 computing centers would then extend down into the third level of as many as 20,000 factories, enterprises, basically like Imagine like a computer input system for uploading and downloading the commands uh, across the, the command economy. Viktor Glushkov's plan, ahead of its time, faces opposition from Soviet leadership, who feel it threatens party control over the economy. In 1970, eight years after the initial proposal, it is denied funding. If we were to sum up in short why there was no Soviet internet, I would argue that computer networking first took place in the U.S. thanks to well-regulated state subsidy and well-managed research collaboration between universities and government. Whereas you see simultaneous attempts to develop computer networking in the Soviet Union break against the rocks of unregulated competition among bureaucrats and ministers and internecine fighting. In short, I think we can see that networking first took shape thanks to capitalists behaving like socialists, not socialists behaving like capitalists. The Soviet Union's unsuccessful attempts to develop a computer network were not the only projects that ultimately failed to live up to their potential. In the latter stages of the Cold War, US President Ronald Reagan looks to go beyond early warning systems such as SAGE and its successors. March 23, 1983. In a televised address, Reagan calls upon the scientific community to develop new technology to combat potential Soviet nuclear strikes. I call upon the scientific community in our country, those who gave us nuclear weapons, to turn their great talents now to the cause of mankind and world peace to give us the means of rendering these nuclear weapons impotent and obsolete. Tonight, I'm taking an important first step. I am directing a comprehensive and intensive effort to define a long-term research and development program to begin to achieve our ultimate goal of eliminating the threat posed by strategic nuclear missiles. Ronald Reagan, I think, is justifiably seen as a, as, as a cold warrior but he also really abhorred nuclear weapons, and he actually had a vision of a world without nuclear weapons. And so for him, 
the, the path to get there involved the development and deployment of highly reliable defenses against ballistic missiles. The Strategic Defense Initiative, or SDI, is an ambitious plan to develop a range of technologies designed to detect and destroy Soviet intercontinental and submarine-launched ballistic missiles before they reach American shores. And his advisors suggested, why don't you do space-based lasers? Many of his advisors came from the aerospace industry, they came from the defense industry, they came from defense contractors, and they said there's a real opportunity here for safety and for our industry if you mounted lasers and other kinds of weapons on top of satellites, or maybe you could have a giant mirror-based system that could somehow reflect lasers at incoming weapons. But either way, somehow you would use a super high-tech space-based system to counter nuclear attacks before they arrived. Critics and the media give Reagan's Strategic Defense Initiative another name. Then along came President Reagan's Strategic Defense Initiative. Sort of an awkward name, so SDI got a nickname. It was typically called Star Wars, especially by its critics. I'm sorry that anyone ever used the appellation Star Wars for it, because it isn't that. Now, most credible scientists thought this was ridiculous. And they said it was ridiculous to Congress. They wrote editorials. They gave interviews saying Star Wars will never work. But by the 1980s, there were very few of these critical scientists actually had access to the halls of power as they had in the 1950s. So the defense contractors assured the president that yes, Star Wars would work. The research and development of laser-based defense systems are not new. The Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories Excalibur project was in development prior to the president's call to the scientific community to develop these new defenses. Project Excalibur, under the guidance of theoretical physicist Edward Teller, a key contributor to the development of the hydrogen bomb, plans to use a nuclear blast to power X-ray lasers that will target and destroy Soviet missiles. Initially designed to be deployed in space, it is later planned to launch from submarines when a Soviet strike is detected. The project goes through a series of tests with disappointing results and is eventually canceled. Its legacy, a symbol of the impracticality of the Star Wars program. The Soviet Union did not mount a parallel defense system in response to SDI, instead continuing to fund advanced missile systems they hope will render it obsolete. Even short of that ambitious goal, SDI promised to impose lots of costs upon the Soviet Union, to force the Soviets to change their nuclear posture and to move away from the things that they did well and they were comfortable with doing, such as large ICBMs, and towards other parts of their posture where they had greater challenges. What we now know is that as the Soviet leadership contemplated SDI, they were confronted by the technological gap between the United States and the Soviet Union. And they, were, they had to ask themselves whether the Soviet economy Soviet society was capable of closing that gap or not. And in the end, they realized, I think correctly, that that, that was impossible. Although the promise of SDI was never realized, not all elements of the program failed. Today's ground-based mid-course defense, or GMD, is based on technology developed as part of the wide-ranging research done on the Strategic Defense Initiative. During the Cold War, information was power. Today, global communication networks built on the technology developed during the Cold War are a part of everyday life. We live in a high-speed, hyper-connected environment. The Internet of Things connects digital devices across both civilian and military industries. Society connects via smart households, cars, and domestic appliances. But now, when we are ordering pizza, or when we are getting a cab or an Uber ride, we are using the results that were made possible by our satellite, Sputnik. Of course, no one remembers it. No one thinks about it now. But it's a fact. Those beep-beep signals made getting hot pizza into our homes today possible. 
such an interesting interweaving of times from what was 60 years ago and what is happening right now. Militaries too engage in warfare, using artificially intelligent weapon systems, unmanned aerial vehicles, global positioning systems and communication satellites. Now more than ever, information is power and it's at our fingertips.